Okay, right, we'll get ready and running into the final session. Uh, thank you for your patience while we've got everything set up. Hopefully everything will stay standing. Um, if not, just stick with us and it will be worth the wait. Um, last year we had the pleasure of getting William to run through a session with Prebellico and he's back for even more with Recon Village. Um, and here he is with Prebellico Pi, which I'm going to read is the Prebellico Intelligence Exfiltration and I'm going to leave him to run through it from now on. Thanks very much. What's up, DEF CON? You guys doing, doing good? I technically threed in my 321 because the day's not over yet. All right, so uh, this is Perbellico Pi, and uh, like I said, this is leveraging the uh, network against the network without the network. <laughs> and really, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm working to push a narrative a little further, uh, just given uh, some of the things that I've experienced um, uh, currently with uh, various different things. So, all right, just go over an agenda. I'm going to give a kind of a brief introduction, right, and then I'm going to give a Perbellico overview. And that's the art of fighting without fighting. The reason why I'm going to do that is not everyone has seen Probellico. And it's still amazing how many people uh, in our community are still subject to groupthink that push back up against us constantly. I was here with a Cisco switch. I dropped it and proved that it happened. I've done it with an HP switch. These are enterprise grade switches. I've done it with Netgear switches. I, I dropped this over at DC 541. And just for a proof of concept, we even jumped on some networks I had zero control of and had all kinds of intel coming out of it. <coughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a brief overview of that just so everyone's tracking what Probellico is and understand, that way they can understand where I'm taking things. Next I'm going to talk about the realities of uh, physical and wireless penetration testing um, uh, and the wireless threat landscapes of uh, those two. Really what I'm looking forward to is just, I'm going to give you just kind of a, um, a brief summary of what that threat landscape looks like, uh, excuse me, what we currently inspect and uh, real world demonstrative impact. Then I'm going to talk about some of the uh, probabilical shortcomings, and that's actually some of the things that drove me to push this further, particularly data loss, data uh, retrieval, or exfil, and uh, also some air gap configurations. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the key point here, which is there is no spoon, and it's talking about your physical network controls and why they're no longer applicable and why it's important to go back to some of the original things. <clears throat> I think that we have a, a problem with a lot of vendors where you know, they've sold us that the, techni the technical controls will save us. And we disregard a lot of uh, very basic principles. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing is I'm just pushing that narrative a little bit further. And I'm all about the blue team. Who's on the blue team here? I love you guys. I do everything for you guys. It's a hard job. But uh, I'm trying to, I'm here to kind of help enable the blue team, especially those that don't necessarily have support in them. There you go. Then I'm going to um, push the data forward with a live demonstration of Probellico Pi, which is the uh, Intel extractor. Talk about the future of Probellico Pi and then offer some closing remarks and then just uh, answer some questions. Okay, so obligatory slide. My name is William. I work for uh, Coal Fire Labs. We hack all the things, physical, human, API, blah, blah, blah. But that's enough about me. Really, I'm just kind of a, a person that likes to push uh, the narrative forward, and that's what I'm here for today. So let's talk about Probellico. Um, some of this content was borrowed from my previous thing, but basically, it's the, it's, I call it the art of fighting without fighting. And basically, it's a network analysis tool. I've seen some people start calling it like a scanner. It's not a scanner. Uh, Probellico does not broadcast or transmit anything. Um, basically, it's something that I rage coded as a proof of concept. <clears throat> I did this because uh, I was constantly being told that uh, some of the things that I was doing was impossible. Uh, and, uh, it, and so I rage coded it to kind of uh, provide a proof of concept and then everybody asked me to start building on some things. And so that's kind of where it came from. But like I said, it, it gathers intel through 100% passive techniques. It's zero touch and man, it's about 20% done but it's going to need an overhaul anyway, um, especially with this push. So. 
So let's do a Prabelka demonstration. So um, like I said before, uh, the community totally believed me and got fully behind me as well as my management and some of those things. But after a while when I started proving some things to them, the realities of uh, what I had started coming in. And uh, some of my guys on the blue side and some of our infrastructure people were really concerned with uh, what I was proving. So I was like, you know, yeah, let's take this to the world, right? And management, you know, they got fully behind me. My peers got behind me, you know. But especially management was like, yeah, let's take this to the world. And let's show them what we have. Actually, to be honest with you, there was a lot of fear uh, about this. There was some talk about maybe we should just not release this, maybe we should take it from you, et cetera, et cetera. But my company really cares about InfoSec, really got behind me and uh, did, excuse me, did what, they, did what they could to allow me to present some of this to you. So that said, this demonstration is a highly obfuscated virtual demo of what Probelico does. Um, I spent a lot of time in a hex editor and things like that and getting approval from the CISO and such. Okay, so basically um, on, on, on the right window, what you're going to see is I'm dumping my uh, IP configuration and then I'm, I'm running TCP dump, which is gospel, which is proving whether or not I'm broadcasting anything. So I want you to kind of pay attention to that kind of in the background. If I'm broadcasting anything, it'll scroll there. And then here on the left, uh, on the bigger window, I want you to show that there's this intel that's spilling. This is kind of a best case scenario for what you can get with Probelico. But as you can see, there's all kinds of uh, intel that's actually spilling here. Some cases, it's unicast. And there can be a lot of juicy things in unicast. I'm able to do all kinds of things, like uh, uh, map out different uh, ports and services uh, that systems are doing, kind of map out host intent, uh, kind of uh, 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 I, do, I have this one technique that I call reverse port scanning, which is where I can map ports on a host behind a firewall that I can't reach, as well as identify the host that's allowed to reach those. Um, and I'm just doing some, you know, real basic hackery, you know, uh, based off the concepts of the three-way handshake and uh, some of those pieces, right? But, you know, like, like I've shown here, you know, I can get things like as sensitive as uh, SNMP community strings, right? So, you know, I've had some infrastructure that they've got like two-factor authentication on the infrastructure, but the guy who deployed it had some really complex uh, SNMP community string that I would never guess myself. But unfortunately, that stuff spills on a switch. I'm doing all this without man-in-the-middle attacks. And if you think about it from an OSI layer model, that's a problem because we build everything off of that, right? <clears throat> but again, you know, uh, finding things like password reset server. Again, I want to thank DISA for approving the password reset server. So useful to me. Thank you. Or test backup server or Rapid7 Nexpose console or anything that I got an ODA in my pocket for. This is so useful and this is free intel that's coming uh, uh, over the wire with next to little effort. So it looks like uh, someone's spraying an SNMP community string. There's an SNMP v1 commu a community string uh, that uh, was you know, somewhat like that that's uh, valid enough to leverage. Again, uh, test backup server. I love altered client backup resource when I attack clients. But anyway, this kind of uh, gives you an idea of, of how that works. And then per the request of the community, uh, what I did is I put in some backup support uh, for uh, uh, reporting capabilities, some of those things. So I'll let that go uh, really quick here and then uh, I'll kind of forward on because I want to get to the real meat of why we're here. So what I'm doing here is I'm opening up a new terminal. I'm just going to run the Probelco, uh, the old school Probelco reporting engine. And uh, what, what that's going to do is it's just going to say, hey, I want you to uh, take a look at the uh, information you gathered and tell me about uh, the attack surface that's here. And you see there's all sorts of useful information to include uh, identified hosts, potential SMP community strings, validated descriptions of what uh, various hosts are on the network, as well as some guidance about how you might go about att attacking this. As I demonstrated last year, you can get very specific with listing uh, <coughs> listing networks and uh, listing uh, uh, particular uh, hosts uh, within those networks and getting some of the data there. But I'm not going to drag that on too much. Um, we did that uh, several times and I keep dropping this everywhere. So if you want me to show you more of this later, let me know and I'll, I'll swing by and show you. But uh, like I said, very useful intel uh, that is gathered 100% passively. Again, that window in the upper right hand corner, I'm not broadcasting anything. So it's zero touch. All right, so let's talk about the physical uh, threat landscape. 
this is my perception of physical security and just about everywhere I go. And I think really uh, the bigger part of the problem that we have here uh, is whether or not we're taking things seriously. I think that we're being sold uh, this concept that uh, the technical controls will save you. And so let's just, yeah, so what? They can get in. Yeah, so what? They can shim doors. Yeah, so what? They get to the server closet, things like that. Um, if I can find my way through their leveraging hangers or little tools and just shim my way through all the way into your organization, I assure you I will destroy you. Unfortunately, though, our industry, the way that we kind of manage this is uh, we carry out these physical threat assessments called audits. And we take a look and we're like, yep, we've got a control there. We're good. And we declare victory, right? Unfortunately, your adversary can operate just like me and can walk their way into place. And I assure you, if they're more malicious than me, which I assure you they are, uh, they can absolutely destroy you with physical access. But it seems like uh, a lot of the physical teams uh, or the people that are trying to enforce physical controls are disregarded constantly. And it seems like a lot of the engagements that I try to uh, pursue, people don't want to pursue these because they're costly or useless, which is truly unfortunate, especially when you're paying for a red team engagement or a physical pen test. You know, uh, uh, as long as destructive attacks aren't uh, in play, I highly encourage you to uh, pursue those. But okay, so that's, that's kind of the thing with uh, physical security. Let's talk about uh, the wireless threat landscape. And I apologize. This is a really old school image that everyone's seen um, showing the, uh, uh, the frequency allocation just for the United States, right? So it's highly overused and I apologize. But anyway, point being is that this has uh, all kinds of uh, uh, potential. For instance, uh, I may or may not have built these and may have tried to leverage these during engagements, but um, if, if a guy like me can build these, anybody can. Uh, some of the stuff is from hacker boxes or whatever else have you, uh, but very useful during engagements. So this right here, for instance, is a USB data uh, exfil device that operates at 433 megahertz in a point-to-point -point network where uh, if I can get access, physical access to a console that I'm quite interested in, I may be able to pass that over 433 megahertz. This right here is, a, is just a wireless bug. Um, so literally, I can plug in a 9 volt battery uh, and I can, you know, tune, tune to whatever frequency I want. And I can uh, sit there and listen to your board conversations or your call center or whatever else have you while you're resetting your passwords and snag that information. Unfortunately, the FCC uh, restricts me from encrypting this. And so um, is radio, audio is, is radio, and that's the best I can do. But uh, let's take another device, for instance. This is a, 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 a Raspberry Pi with, a, with the ability to uh, uh, talk over 3G, 4G, right? And so we could passively collect data, steal data, exfil data um, uh, over uh, some of those uh, alternate frequencies. Yet this is what our assessments consist of. So I highlighted the two red boxes where I typically see things and we're like, secure wireless networks, we're good. Yet we declare a victory again and these devices that are real world that I've talked about before operate completely outside of those bands. And it's not just about my perception of things. These are real attacks. So this is a classic example of a blend of physical compromise and wireless compromise with uh, Barclays Bank. They were able to get over $2.2 million and they could not figure out how the heck they were pulling this off, but they were literally working their way into, into the server room, having a KVM configuration and stealing data that way. All of their assessments and audits and everything passed and they couldn't figure it out. They only got caught because they got greedy with an additional site. So uh, here's the greed. Save Barclays. But the fact is that's a real world compromise involving physical security and wireless assessments. And again, that's operating out of those bands that we typically audit out of. Yet a lot of my customers are like, well, I don't understand. We're doing all the things and checking all the boxes. Why are they still owning us? Sometimes because your real world adversaries are desperate. And like I've said before, you should never underestimate the creativity of a desperate individual. Okay, so let's just trans transition a little bit, you know, because this is about Probelco, and let's talk about Probelco's shortcomings, right? There, there are quite a few of them. I mean, first of all, I wrote this as a proof of concept out of rage to prove that switches spill. So it's an okay tool. Um, but uh, it, it kind of it comes with some caveats. So like in air-gapped environments, you know, uh, Probelco is, you know, not magic. It can't pull from uh, uh, a multiple air-gapped environments, or that is, it couldn't until now. Uh, but also, uh, Probelico kind of depends on your position of the network. It's kind of interesting. Um, when I run Probelico in some environments, I'll find that there's not a whole lot of data. 
and then in some other environments, I'll find that there's a ton of data, and I'm still trying to understand the drivers for that. But there have been instances where um, where I, I will execute Berbelico and I'll see absolutely nothing until 4 p.m. I remember this one time with the customer. I said, hey, what happens at 4 o'clock? And the customer was like, oh, uh, well, that's the sock change. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, those dudes hate each other because they both say they're doing it wrong. And it turns out the way that the sock does things at 4 p.m. was very useful to me. But you know we're, we're kind of dependent on based off of that position of where we're, where we're executing this via either overt or covert methods, right? So uh, also uh, device discovery can be devastating, especially in a red team engagement. I mean, I love drop-in Probelico in a red team engagement because it does not transmit. You can't see it. Lots of data. But if somebody finds that little thing and they're like, "What is that?" Even if it says IT security, don't touch, and they remove it, I lose my data. And that's a sad day. So some of the ways you know that we try to go get that data uh, is through Xfil. Uh, there's uh, various methods, right? You've got like C2 methods uh, that uh, you may want to try to pursue to get that data where you don't have to visit again, and then you've got sneaker net where you got to visit, right? You got to go visit that site. But that's also risky, especially you know if you're if you have a scope requirement where it requires surreptitious methods of entry every time. That is to say, you can't leave forensic evidence that you were there. That's a lot of overhead, you know, to be able to go and get that data via Snakernet. So let's just talk about some of the shortcomings. First off, Probelic was awesome. I don't care if people don't like it. It's been very useful to me, and I've gotten great reports back. Had a guy last year who told me that it helped him take over the hotel network. Uh, I was a little concerning, but what he basically told me is there was a bridge that he wasn't expecting, and that's what Probelico does. It challenges your assumptions about what you think the environment is, and it turns out that the controls that they had weren't exactly effective, and he was able to take that over. I encouraged him not, not to do illegal things, et cetera, et cetera, but you know, it's kind of interesting, some of the things that it's uh, brought to light, even in some of my assessments. So in my opinion, Probelico is awesome. But you know, we're, we know that we're going to be placed somewhere here on this network, and we don't exactly know where. Especially someone else is deploying a device for us. You know, uh, Jack, where did you plug me in, man? I don't know. If there was a switch there, I, or a plug. I, I have no idea, right? Uh, and sometimes, you know, the intel can be uh, better on one side than the other, just due to the nature of networks and the way Probelco works. But the bigger problem is we don't know about the security controls that we're going to be running into because we're investing a lot in these technical controls, which are great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking them and saying that they're junk. It's just <clears throat> I'm going to prove that uh, they're not as helpful as one might think. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but, the, but the reality is, as an attacker, um, there's going to be this uh, uh, massive infrastructure, especially with a mature organization, and trying to exfil data technically is going to be a bit uh, difficult, right? It's probably going to look something like this, right? And when I'm trying to think of a way to kind of exfil data, or when my friends are like, dude, you got to help me find a way to exfil the data, you know, I'm going to leverage something that may help me kind of leverage uh, 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 a, a C2 to be able to exfil that data. But you know what? In some cases, that's going to get caught, which is great. But some organizations need to be nudged forward accordingly, uh, uh, you know, to improve their uh, posture. So using something that they're going to catch immediately is kind of useless, especially in red team engagements. So I'm trying to see here and I'm thinking, how can I exfil the data from Probelico with, without knowing what the security controls are? How does that work? What can I do to pull this off? It says I, no mute, okay. And then it, hits, it kind of hits me. How can I bypass the controls that I can't predict? What is way, what is kind of, you know, I was proposing some of these things to my buddies and they're like, no, they know that, no, they've grown that, you gotta be more creative, come on, help me out. And I'm just like, man, it's just, I'm racking my brains, you know, I'm doing ICM, ICMP C2, I've got a little trick with TCP, and I'm just trying to figure it out, and it hits me. There is no spoon. This is mind blowing to me. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm the dumbest guy in the room. But what I realize is I'm trying to fight against all these security controls in this network. Uh, you know, why am I operating by those things that they've defined? Why should I operate that way? It's 2019, 2020. You know, things are coming around, lots of stuff is improving around us, and suddenly I realize I don't need to operate around those security controls. Why should I? My adversaries aren't. That was proven by Barclays several years ago, right? 
Then I suddenly realized, well, f fuck the security controls. Fuck trying to fight all that. You know, if I want to stretch an organization that just doesn't care about wireless or physical and things like that, I need to address my narrative because that's what we do as red teamers for the benefit of the blue, especially when they're trying to get those budget for the blue, right? In fact, fuck the network across the board. I don't need the network, right? Because there is no spoon. We've been operating uh, the, with these adversarial simulations under those controls to test those controls. And don't get me wrong, those are good to test and physical pen tests and things like that. But sometimes you reach a point uh, in your organizational growth that you need someone to test you uh, or, push, or push things beyond the limit. And we've been checking boxes, like I said, with wireless and physical engagements. Uh, and everyone's just saying everything's good, but we're constantly getting compromised. And then, like I said, there is no spoon. There's no network. There's no security control. And this is what Prevail Kopai is about. All right, hero versus goat theory. So what we have here is, uh, and again for the haters that say this is impossible, I've got a, uh, another type of managed switch. I dropped Cisco and I dropped uh, a line from Cisco that said this is possible, but I did this with a Cisco switch. I decided to bring an HP managed switch. And what we have here are some really rough Pine Alpha 64 boards. I tried to bring the enterprise to you, and that's very hard and costly to do, coming to DEF CON on my back. But what this, what this is is basically just a bunch of Linux servers. And so by now, the CAM table or the binding table of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, of the switch is fully populated. And so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going I'm to get that. Don't worry about it, boys. I got it. I know it's wrong. Okay. Okay. So here we go, hero versus goat theory. I want to point out, just a quick question for you. How many of you think I can extract information from your infrastructure without leveraging your infrastructure? Oh, some brave votes. Absolutely. Let's see what happens. This right here is nothing special. It's just a Raspberry Pi with a, a really terrible yet survived uh, antenna configuration that I did and just some custom code. Uh, this chip here is very expensive. It cost me a couple bucks. But it's not plugged into anything. What this simulates is um, I'm at my hotel room after I physically compromised you and I want to collect that data. Or perhaps from around the world. Is that possible? Let's see. This monitor is me in the hotel or wherever I want to steal the data comfortably. That monitor is the device that's plugged into the switch that you can't see because Probellico is a ghost. Man, I sure hope this works. Right here, I'm stealing data from your network 100% passively. Unfortunately, the VM running QRX is terrible, which you can see over 950 megahertz. Something you don't audit for or look for is where I'm seeing the data. <clears throat> Based on the conditions of this chip, because I care, it's fully AES encrypted. But what I see here, after physical compromise, I will see here remotely if it all works. So let's just get for a bit. I'll see what else I can do. I'm a little nervous about this. I'll see if I can get GQRX to keep up. I don't know why it's not going to happen. Is it transmitting anymore? Is it scrolling? Uh, yeah, yeah. 
this one is they're both the same. Yeah, they're both the same. Okay. What I'm going to do, I've got another node plugged in here. I'm going to do some SSH stuff, see if I can get a little bit more traffic. What they're doing essentially is they're SSH at each other, pulling their host name, SCPN, doing a bunch of netcat stuff. This is a hack. This is the best way I can bring you an enterprise with five pine alpha 64 boards, which is amazing, by the way. Uh, but uh, let's see if I can nudge it a little further. Anything changing? Yeah. Okay. Give it a minute. Let's try this. Oh, yeah. What do we got? What do we got? Oh! Unicast packets can't be captured on a switch anonymously or passively. That's not going to TCP port. By simply logging in on a host on the network, my rogue device, which by the way, doesn't have an IP address, just a little unicast packet. That's good too, that's awesome. Let's see what else we can do though. I have to actually log in and do something. Um, So I can't see the monitor anymore, but it looks like I pulled an SNMP community one string remotely without leveraging your network. I'm stealing your data. I wish GQRX didn't fail me, but anyway, what you would see there is you'd see it go up and down and chirping. So I'm just going to let that run. Hopefully nothing else comes of it. But that right there is a Perbelico Pi, at least the first part of it. So let's talk a little bit about some Probelical Pi exfiltration topologies. We're going to extend it a little bit further, right? Because uh, I don't want to sit in your parking lot all the time. So here we have your typical corporate environment and good old Willie, malicious as hell, is going to show up and is going to drop a couple uh, Pi transceivers or Pi collectors or whatever the hell I want to do. And he's going to possibly, uh, depending on what I need to do from a threat narrative, he's going to go possibly uh, uh, add some additional things that I call snitches. Snitches. And uh, snitches are kind of a, a special purpose device, special built device. And these things are designed to operate outside of your network but steal your data in all kinds of ways that you can't see. Your technical controls are dead to me. So as demonstrated here, um, your corporate environment, mind you, it's just a couple feet, but you're talking miles in some cases. <clears throat> I'm able to extract all kinds of useful data, maybe show up with a pretext, be able to work my way through it, maybe get a password. Uh, in some cases, you can uh, map out a potential O-Day inside and then just show up and root a host. But what if that's too far? Well, I can use a Pi transceiver. So for instance, let's say that the facility I'm attacking is like, you know, a million square feet and it's got concrete walls all through it and trying to get that frequency all the way to my hotel is just rough. I might but I might drop a Pi transceiver, which as suggested to some of my peers, might look like a really disgusting rat trap outside your building with solar power and I'm exfilling data out of your network. By leveraging the network against the network without the network, I'm stealing your information. Let's talk about air gap topologies. And this was, this came as a really specific request, trying to figure out how to do that. And it turned out, it worked out just really well for me. So we've got air gap environments one and two. Oh, I labeled them right. That's good. I'm going to drop a couple uh, Pi collectors or transceivers or whatever on there. And I'm going to be stealing your data from this air gapped environment. But the beauty of this, since these things are kind of operating in a hive mesh like mine, by the way, if you find one of these, they're just copying data to each other. Again, without the network. 
might deploy a couple snitches depending on the scenario that I'm looking for. And again, I'm just gonna collect that remotely off your site, either nearby within a couple miles, or maybe I wanna extend that range a couple miles, maybe 30 miles or whatever, but again, comfortably in the comfort of my own home or hotel. Well, the beauty of this is what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually leveraging a chipset called LoRaWAN. So let's talk a little bit about LoRaWAN and why that's significant. So LoRaWAN, basically is the Internet of Things. I forget the term that I coined a little bit ago, but I said that the Internet of Things would be leveraged by the adversary, and it is quite convenient. Turns out there's a community of these devices that are hard to come by or not uh, that uh, support all kinds of things like gas meters, parking meters, whatever else have you. As those things gather data, we want to be able to ag aggregate that data in some form. But how do you do that without the internet? Well, thank you to the Internet of Things community. Thanks to them, uh, I'm able to actually leverage the same kind of thing. So let's, let's kind of take a look at what that looks like. So basically all these Internet of Things or Williams Pi device can reach out to these devices that are all over the world, which I'll show you in a second, and they can push that data all out to me. So in a city that you're probably living in, it kind of looks like this with parking meters or gas meters or whatever all those little internet things are. And they're basically transmitting that data to a device that's connected to the internet, which allows me to reach um, you know, the application server or Williams attack server. So they're really hard to come by, very few of them in the world and they're easily accessible. Fortunately, the, thing, the, the interesting thing about Probelico is that it's only gonna transmit um, updated intelligence that it's found, so it's gonna actually use very little data, and by, the, by default, it's encrypted, but the way I'm doing it, I have to do a little extra encryption myself. Uh, but basically, the community will allow you to use these, because everyone's like all about, excited about IoT, so everyone's setting these up in their house, and by the way, I can participate as well. Uh, also, just fun fact, it's fun to set up your own gateway and see the data that uh, could potentially come through. It appears to be encrypted so far, but just wait. Okay, so, you know, we talked about the Internet of Things and all these gateways that are all around us that we can, uh, you know, there's over 8,000 that I saw the other night. So with that, if I don't want to sit in my hotel room, I can just go through the Internet of Things, leverage that, go over the Internet, and collect my data from wherever I'm at. Well, what kind of data? Are we just talking about network data? No, we gotta push that narrative forward, bro. Your technical controls won't save you. So everybody knows, or most people know, that USB wireless plus, uh, or USB networking plus Linux and maybe something like Responder on maybe a USB armory equals credentials. If you don't know that, it's glorious. Unfortunately, you gotta go back and get that data. But if I add a really expensive $3 chipset to this and tell Pi about it, I get targeted offsite login credential exfiltration covertly. So if you had a air-gapped workstation where maybe somebody is changing a highly sensitive file at 8 a.m. every day, and it's fully air-gapped, and they have all of these controls, if I can physically breach that perimeter, I might be able to drop this, and over the Internet of Things, I can get a hashed password and do what I need to do. Just come up with a couple other things here. I don't know if you guys know, but it, it's possible to potentially leverage uh, a Raspberry Pi or a Pi Zero in a way where you can man in the middle HID devices uh, and, uh, 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 and get a basic keylogger out of that. Again, add this very expensive chipset. I paid a premium of $10 for this because uh, I didn't look for a good deal. And what you have is an offsite keyboard logging device for exfiltration that does not use your network for exfil, but it steals stuff from your network. And you won't see it because you're not opting the wireless spectrum and you're not taking physical security very seriously. My win, your loss. I've got an idea. Everybody has call centers. Wait a minute, do we reset passwords over the phone in call centers or give away credit card numbers? What if we have a device that has voice to text capabilities and on keywords decides to chirp over the Internet of Things and tell me the things that I need to know? 
either for, to back up my pretext or provide what I need to destroy you remotely. I got an idea. I love bypassing badge readers. And an ESP32, or uh, sorry, an ESP key uh, is a, a device that I absolutely love and adore, that I love putting behind your card readers, uh, and I steal your credentials as you go by. You can be like three-factor security, biometrics, pin code, card, and I can steal that because it's all weekend. But what if we took an ESP key, instead of having to be in the parking lot, interact with uh, a web server within close range with some antennas or whatever else have you, which is a little weird, but highly effective. Um, what if we just uh, extract that data from across the world, make myself my own little key? Maybe I can clone your cards from the other side of the United States when I'm working with one of my buddies on the other side. It saves me money and overhead. I don't have to fly people anywhere now. I can locally source them accordingly. He can drop the device. I sit in the comfort of my home, bring up my computer, and your card, uh, your weekend card data comes to me. And it's just beautiful, right? So that's what a, a snitch is. But really, a snitch is just subject to creativity. There are so many applications that I can think of that I can apply this, but every single one of these things is stealing data from your organization via exfiltration techniques that your security controls can no longer stop or control or see or whatever else have you. Uh, and again, the reason why I'm bringing this to the community is I'm looking to extend the narrative, the attack narrative, that we've seen in real life, but we don't, but we want to pretend like it doesn't exist, like Barclays, uh, and uh, kind of push things along uh, so that we are auditing all of the things and that we're not drinking the Kool-Aid of our security vendors that are telling us that this technical control will save you. Because if William gets on your site, I will destroy you and I will do it for your benefit. But I'm the good guy. All right, so that's enough of that. Let's just talk about Provoca's future, right? First off, again, I, I made this thing as a proof of concept, and man, it is a hack. What I really need to do is rewrite this thing where there's a community-driven intelligence gathering interface, or kind of like a way where you can define intel that you want to extract and just upload that through uh, push requests and such, and where the Probelical engine will process those files accordingly, uh, and then uh, people can contribute to uh, maybe little regexes that are interesting with data they may notice that it's spilling on a network that's benefit or beneficial for us all. Also, uh, one of the things I really want to start with is uh, Probelical supporting full LoRaWAN, um, uh, uh, but that's just one of many instances that Pi could be uh, exfil from. I had a guy that said, I will stop you at 950 megahertz. I was like, okay, well, I'll do 918 megahertz or 415 megahertz. You're not getting the concept here. You need to audit your wireless and understand what's chirping in, in your backyard. So what I want to do with that as well, when I kind of define that center, is be able to uh, where, have it where the community, where people like you, which are smarter than me, can come up with something that's even better than LoRaWAN. Like here, here's a better idea to uh, exfil data, and we can provide a real easy interface to be able to define those things. But in the end, like I said, Probelical will assist red and blue teams. I've spoken before about how uh, Probelical can be a very useful uh, tool for indicators of compromise on the blue side. Since you can't predict a Probelical instance, you can't see it because it doesn't transmit, it makes it really hard for guys like me that are hell-bent on destroying you uh, to leverage it accordingly. So like typically when I own a, an organization, maybe I can tell the scene to lie to you. That's useful. It's always fun to tell Windows host that it's Linux and watch it swear to you that it's Linux. I can do a lot of those things, but a Probelico instance, I can't do. I can't do that because I can't see it. And uh, on the blue side with Probelico, given that there's no overhead, it's zero touch, you can have it kind of map out your environment and just let it sit. And if it notices something, something that's unusual, you may be able to leverage that as an IOC. So I think it'll be good for blue and red. Obviously, this is more of a red update because that's what I do. I hack all the things. That's what we do at Coal Fire Labs. We steal everything because we want to have a brighter, better future. Anyway, like I said, it'll assist those through attack, audit, and fence. Uh, but uh, one last thing, this tool will not replace traditional methods of reconnaissance or exploitation. Stop asking me to make this thing do your pen test. Your clients deserve better than that. Your employer deserves better than that. This is designed to challenge your assumptions about what you think you know about reconnaissance. And I hope today that I've challenged your perspective on 
the real world of the attack servers out there. So look, in closing, like I said before, switches or snitches, don't forget that. The people who say that switches don't leak data, they just don't know what they're talking about. It's been very useful for a lot of people. Uh, like I said, this is good for both offense and defense, preventing that 100% zero touch uh, reconnaissance. And like I said, uh, I think it's time for the offensive security team, guys like me, to drive a narrative uh, that forces the blue teams to consider validating physical security controls through actual physical attacks, not audit and check boxes, boxes and stuff, and auditing the, the wireless spectrum. You know, I think that that needs to be picked up again. Like I said, Probelco Pi permits this hardware-based out-of-band remote intelligence gathering and interaction, allowing attackers to provide demonstrative impact of physical security compromises with very little overhead. Like I said, uh, the last thing, technical controls will not save you like your vendors are telling you. Physical security is important. And in closing, like I said, I'm not sorry, you're welcome. I do this for you guys, so. And that's why I have for you. Are there any questions or concerns? Yes. Well, the beauty of this is that it's omnidirectional transmission. Fortunately, William was kind enough to throw some AES wrappers in there. I am just a hacker. I'm not a programmer, but I do have AES uh, encryption. I could kind of prove that with a Pi client if you want to see it. Uh, but what it does is it's omnidirectional spread spectrum. And what it is, uh, what, what happened was a company uh, got an FCC license and said, hey, we'd love to support the Internet of Things. And like all the Internet of Things guys got involved and said, I want to do that. I want to sell that. And so they sublessed that, like, that license and such. And now we have uh, chipsets as cheap as like 10 bucks. So it, it goes everywhere. Yeah, certainly. So uh, the question was, um, uh, is Probelco always transmitting that data or is it storing it? Do I have to get it later? Uh, how am I not losing the data? So these are actually operating kind of like a hive mind. The database here has the same database there. The beauty of this is I don't have to plug this into anything. Like I can literally just power pack it. You know, I can hide it behind the fridge or whatever. I can put a hundred of these around in the environment. And you can start going around, it'll be like whack-a-mole. But it won't matter because uh, I've got this mesh-like infrastructure that's just pumping this data out. Drip, 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 drip. And so uh, that's how it's kind of dealing with the data loss. Back in the day, when I have a device like that, if you were truly operating in a covert method with no transmission, uh, like in some red teams, I would, like I said, I would drop this at a bank or whatever, get a lot of intel out of it, and they didn't know about it unless they're like, what the hell is that on the switch stack? I don't know. That might lead to data loss. But in this case, it doesn't anymore because I've got 5, 10, 20, 30 of these, whatever, right? These are really cheap. Um, this is the more schwanky Raspberry Pi version, but I'm pretty sure you can do this on much less power, uh, much less hardware. And uh, the beauty of this transceiver uh, is that uh, it's very low power. That's the beauty of LoRaWAN, actually. So it means that I can let this run for a long time. Heck, I could penetrate your site physically. And I could just let that sit for years if I wanted to until it came back one day and said, there's a test Windows XP host over there. And then I could show up on site and destroy you. you know, so there's, there's, no, there's no more data loss if you actually go and start deploying these really expensive devices across the network. Does that answer your question? Uh, the answer is no, because they're operating by themselves. There was a while back where I was going to try to go with this hub and spoke configuration. Who's going to be the master transmitter? And then it just hit me that everybody should be the ma master transmitter, right? I'm an equal opportunity guy. It's unfair for one of my pies to be the master. So I just said, you know, we're all masters. And then we call, you, you all can do whatever you want. Uh, in, this, in this case, I, I use kind of a, a collector and, and a reporter uh, kind of model. But to be honest with you, they all have transceivers. So they can receive and transmit and repeat. And, you know, everybody gets an equal shot at your data. Does that answer your question? Awesome. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. 
Absolutely. The question was, which is an excellent question, is what kinds of measures would I do to mitigate this risk? Well, most of us can't afford things like the federal government that try to wirelessly isolate a place. You know, so obviously that's expensive. I would say that we would start off with taking our physical security a little bit more seriously and the people that are working to implement that. Um, part of the problem with this right here is this is hardware, so I have to breach you physically. I think that if we work to uh, uh, harden some of those controls, that would initially help out. Number two, it would help with port security to be enabled if you truly shut off a port and you lock access to that, that is, because if you have port security enabled, I'm just going to try to break into your closet, but, um, but if you had port security enabled where I wasn't able just to sniff that data, that would kind of help. However, there's a problem. When you connect Perbelico proper, not even this, uh, to just wireless networks, as the DC 541 group will attest, all kinds of data spills from there, even open networks. In fact, sometimes frames float from your secure side to your insecure side, which is weird. I demonstrated that and talked about that a little bit, uh, or I had some proof of concepts of that uh, last year, uh, where I had a frame that came from one side of the wireless zone and floated its way all the way up this switch stack that was completely unrelated to me. I, th I thought Probelka was lying, but what happened was it picked up a frame, a wireless frame from a Roku device, all the way through this switch and uh, the switched infrastructure to uh, a physical system with a VM, and it picked up you know, uh, uh, it mapped a TCP port, which meant that you have some sort of unicast traffic uh, that's being transferred from a wireless network <laughs> that's fully encrypted and passed all the way up the switch infrastructure to me where I'm not even part of the wireless network. So it's kind of a problem. And I wish I had a better answer for that, but I really think that it would start to have effective port security. It's amazing how often I can find a place that's got open port security. I think you might have to really consider what true wireless isolation is with your open networks. I know it's cheap and you save a lot of bucks to share, you know, an open uh, network SSID with, uh, uh, with, with, you know, an encrypted SSID or enterprise, you know, uh, based authentication and sharing that infrastructure. I know that, that kind of makes sense. I know that your vendors will tell you that it doesn't spill data, but, you know, whatever. You know, download ProBelco and connect to some open networks and see what you see. You know, sometimes you're not going to see a whole lot, but sometimes it's surprising. Absolutely. So the question was, have I ever seen a secure environment where they've scanned for all open frequencies? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, those people are well funded by uh, the sweat of our backs. Uh, most people aren't going to be able to do that all of the time. I would argue doing it every once in a while might help you avoid a Barclays incident. Uh, and we're kind of talking internally about how we can help save some bucks on that but what I, um, because it, that's, that's an expensive resource. But what we do right now is we say, we're not going to do that because we're just not going to do it. It's useless. It's pointless. Well, now I've, I'm releasing something where you can do that. And I assure you, I'm not the only guy doing this. I, I guarantee you. I'm just providing you a proof of concept where uh, assessing that uh, uh, spectrum uh, is important. In fact, though, I found Fortune 50 companies that have really expensive WIPS in infrastructure, and they don't even leverage that to monitor just those standard frequencies because they've gotten lazy. Um, and, uh, uh, and that may be because people aren't uh, pushing that, uh, that narrative. So I'm not saying that this is going to be cheap or easy, but what I am telling you is doing the standard check in the box audit, um, you know, it's going to put you at risk. And it happened with Barclays and it's happening probably to several organizations that we can think of right now. So any other questions? Okay, well, like I said, I'm William. I'm with Coal Fire Labs. We hack all the things. I want to thank Coal Fire for letting me come and uh, give this talk. And I want to thank you for your time for allowing me to uh, demonstrate this to you. Remember, switches are snitches. I'm going to do what I can to help the blue team out. And I'm going to do what I can to help my brothers on the red side, trying to push that narrative forward. If you guys have any other questions or concerns, you can reach me out. Uh, DM me on Twitter if I'm on Twitter. Uh, and I can give you a signal. And you know, we can talk further if you want to. So thank you.